I got to a point where I thought, yeah, I can do this for a living. The last thing I wanted to do was appease my peers or, you know, the people in the gallery world. I, I wanted to do what the hell I wanted and like damn the rest of them. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, it's the Killer Keller Podcast, transmitting live Central London Essentials. You need to, need to be, Jesus, still early over here. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Um, you're on now. Um, if you haven't checked out the Kellervision app, get involved. 24-7 street culture for your sins. Uh, sharing is caring, as, all, as we always know. Um, we've got a very special guest inside the place today. Very excited. Mostly because it's very... You say every so often I get these opportunities to to chat with somebody that merges music with street art with just social commentary on a, such a level that meets street culture heads on. Finn Dak inside the place. How are you, brother? Good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, I'm all right. I'm all right. <laughs> it's the rest of them. Although we are coming out the clear, we're looking good at the moment, aren't we? Apparently, yeah. The world is turning ever so slowly. <laughs> But uh, it's a slow process, isn't it? All of these sorts of things. And uh, man, I tell you what, you've been doing your thing for a minute, haven't you? Yeah. I started yeah. late, so I had lots of time to make up for. <laughs> well, t- well, hold on. You started late? Yeah. Super Talk to about that. I, um, I had a whole life beforehand. In fact, I, I had sort of numerous lives, really. In my 20s, I was a, a DJ on the house music scene. In my okay. 30s, I was kind of settled down with a small family. And then um, in my f- just before my 40th birthday, uh, the relationship fell apart. I went through some like bad legal situations and essentially just needed something to take my mind off what I was going through. And so I started painting and obviously street art was um, becoming Burgening. very popular Big. at the time and mm. it was all around me. So it just felt like the right thing to be um, channeling my energies towards, and that was this is, this is actually crazy, man. Because when I when I see your stuff, I and and taking also to critical acclaim the fact you're you're working with Mick Rock at present, mm-hmm. which that in itself is just like the the royalty levels on this is just like mind blowing. <laughs> but as you don't know about Mick Rock, then you've clearly been lost in some alternative pop culture (laughs) hole somewhere but um yeah photographer extraordinaire rock and roll genius many album covers and you know iconic photos alongside parallel your your street art merging and marrying it it seems quite hard to believe that after all this time you 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 say that (laughs) you're a late arrival to this thing that's that's crazy yeah, well, I, I had no training either, and I had never, uh, I hadn't grown up with graph or any of, the, any of those types of scenes where I would have used spray paint. So that old adage about the 10,000 hours, well, I wanted to get to those 10,000 hours as soon as I could. So I just worked nonstop for years and years and years. Does Everything. that apply to a lot of things you think, the 10,000 hours thing? Yeah, I mean, for me, because I, I, I think you might have said that I had a natural um, talent towards art, but I had no training and I had no mentors. And so um, for me, everything I'd done was about just trying it out and, and learning as I went along. So the more hours that I did, obviously the, well, hopefully the better I got at it. <laughs> that might not be the case, but I think it is for me. I think I, I would, <laughs> I would say that when it comes to the 10,000 hours theory, it it also applies, I guess your, your batting average on, you know, if you have a run of like five, what's the average of five that get through the net and what's the, the rest that don't, you know, that also comes into that 10,000 hours thing as well. So it's just yeah. about turning it around, isn't it? Exactly. And it also means that your greatest hits, you have more to choose from. So they should be really greatest hits, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. like average stuff. <laughs> I'm going to be controversial and actually extend that suggestion photography for photography as a, uh, as, as a, as an art in 2021. Yeah. Um, 
a very different kind of atmosphere compared to like back in the day with would the likes of Mick would just be like taking those iconic live moments that could not ever be captured again. Mm-hmm. But now we've got like this selfie cu- culture that's well into its <laughs> however many years. Uh, and it's almost like, you know, you go to an average selfie fanatic's phone and they got like 80, 90 shots of the same thing and they just find it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah. that's the kind of culture that it is now, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> I think the, um, the thing about mixed photography is, is that, there wasn't really a rock and roll photographer before him. I wouldn't have said there might have been people like David Bailey who kind of dipped into that scene. Mm. But essentially, I think he, him in the seventies and Anton Corbine in the eighties, they basically defined what cool rock and roll photography should look like, mm. and that stayed with us. I mean, the fact that Mick is still working to this day and still being requested to give certain artists the the cool treatment—that's testament mm. to sort of what he is, I guess, defined as his branding. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, it's the okay sign. It's yeah, the, exactly. Yeah. And that's not easy to do. No. In, yeah, any, in any walk of life, really, I guess. For sure. I'm trying to think of other... And like you say, I mean, it's, it's few and far between, particularly in the uh, uh, media arts world. Uh, Ro, 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 is it Ross Halfin? He's another photographer yeah. of the rock world. But yeah, like Mick is he's the go-to sign. Um, and anyway, you know, back 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 to you. I mean, the collaboration is clear. I mean, when you see the art pieces that are coming out of your guys, Madora, right? That was that's Midaro. the name. Of, that's Madaro. Midaro. That's the one. It's the I mean, first, I, it's the first two letters of each of Mick's names. God, yeah. I, I always have titles for my pieces, and sometimes those titles are based on um, ethnic or um, foreign language words that look or sound pretty to me but with uh, this one i wanted it to have kind of um not necessarily a hidden meaning but like a, a kind of a a joke meaning if you like because madaro sounds like a if you like an asian or oriental name yeah and obviously i'm into orientalism and so is mick and so it just seemed like a good thing to do you really are man it, it and i think that's what I mean, again, man, the fact that you were coming into this late and you didn't know a great deal about Graph or any, or any of the, you know, the, the early, you know, inceptions of what becomes street art. Yeah, you took some pretty heavy influences. And for, you know, like you say, they weren't, they weren't given to you on a piece of paper as like, find your lane here. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I've always been an outsider as well. I mean that could well have been because of my lack of uh, history in those kind of cultures. And also I think, you know, I looked at things slightly differently. I was coming at it from a, a pop angle, if you like the, it's always been the same. Like even with my music, I've always had a sort of a pop leaning to it. And yeah. of course that kind of thing is not necessarily accepted in a lot of um, cultures and cliques, mm. but I didn't care. It's like, I started so late. I wasn't doing it to keep other people happy. I was actually doing it to try to make myself happy. And mm. once I started getting into it and I thought I got to a point where I thought, yeah, I can do this for a living. The last thing I wanted to do was appease my peers or, you know, the people in the gallery world. I, I wanted to do what the hell I wanted and like damn the rest of them. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah I do. I, you, bro, I do. I mean, I, I have a lot of assorted graffiti characters come on the show. And um, one thing I'm I'm very mindful of at times when these kind of precursor these kind of rules are um, applied that this is the this is the what you need to do in terms of being a, a legal graffiti writer or graffiti writer in general. But but it's one of the most free form, most explosive art cultures ever, and putting rules to it just doesn't seem right. Yeah, 100%. And I I always thought that right from the word go. Like for me, the whole point about it was freedom from the kind of rules and regulations that would come with the gallery world. Mm. But then when you get into it, it's like, oh no, you you can't use a brush or you you can't do this or you can't do that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I can. I, I can do whatever the hell I want. It's not down to you to tell me either what to paint or how to paint. I'll just do what I want because that's what's making me happy. Mm. And I didn't particularly care if I if I fitted in 
or whether mm-hmm. or not my peers appreciated what I did. In actual fact, the 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 whole thing about coming at it late was to have a kind of um, an attitude where, okay, this is for me. I've done all the mm-hmm. stuff in my life that I thought would make me happy, and I've done all the stuff that I thought was expected of me, and mm. none of it made me happy. So now I'm going to do something that makes me happy, and I'm not going to care if you like it or if you accept it. I'm still going to do it. That's I wasn't relying shame. on anyone for anything. Like I wasn't, um, I wasn't approaching it in the early days, and I, I still don't think I do in in terms of making money. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, for sure. The the I, I'm able to support myself quite easily as an artist, but mm-hmm. the money has never been a thing for me because I, I had money in my twenties when I was a DJ, and I had all the trappings of that, and mm-hmm. it, I still wasn't happy. So I'd kind of gotten over that that thought that money is what makes you happy mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I was just doing it for the sake of it I was painting and learning as I went along and getting better uh, hopefully um and everything just seemed to organically kind of work itself out you know right. yes I'm along for the ride but I, I wasn't steering the ship as it were no I get it I get it what was your DJ name at the- <laughs> it was just Finbar my real name I wasn't I wasn't a big DJ but the, at the time you know um you'd go out and you you'd be earning like 2 or 300 pounds cash in hand and I'd do two or three gigs a week maybe so that's that's a lot of money yo yeah <laughs> Honestly, I've yeah. been there, man. I know exactly what you mean. It's it's actually it's un- a year out, and it feels so unthinkable. What you get yeah. you get paid for doing something you like live, <laughs> you man? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I wasn't I wasn't one of the big earners or one of the big names, but I I had a a healthy DJ um, lifestyle, let's say. Yeah, and, and also I had a healthy kind of diary. Like it was pretty filled most of the time. Uh, um, and what's more to the point is I, I really enjoyed it. You know, I, I got out of it in the end because I had stopped enjoying it. The, the scene had changed. The drugs yeah. changed, if you like. Yeah, yeah, it yeah, yeah, wasn't, yeah. It wasn't fun anymore. What's, uh, whereabouts was this? Where was your main circuit of, of DJs? It was in London. London in yeah. sort of like um, mixed clubs, I guess you'd call them. Um, well, Soho or Water? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. So- away. Of course, yeah. Well, yeah, Soho, yeah. Mostly. Interesting. What, in the night, late nineties, early noughties? No, no, no. Uh, late eighties, early nineties. Okay, so this from was... eighty nine all the way through to, um, I guess ninety seven or ninety eight. I mean, essentially the explosion of the house music culture, both here and in Ibiza. So we're talking. Um, oh well, yeah, I guess we're talking that that kind of golden era of of house music where you'd have like the new romantic era falling yep. into the more drug rave culture is that what you yeah for sure wow talk to me about then wow well so i mean my, my interest in i mean the reason i know who mick rock is because my interest in music has stemmed from a very early childhood because my yeah. mom and dad loved music as well and so we kind of knew all their music because they were constantly playing it um and then when I, we got into the 70s i couldn't say that i was into punk but i was definitely into bands like joy division and then in, oh yeah and then into the depeche modes and the the kind of synthesizer people. Yeah, yeah. So that that culture of like independent music and making your own music was there from a very early age. Like uh, all the bands I liked were on independent labels, mostly, mm-hmm. I guess. And then the fact that Depeche, people like Depeche Mode were sampling, and that, of course, led to sa- real samplers. And um, that all leads through to the sort of Chicago house scene. And then that comes back full circle to England in the late 80s. It's actually mad how intrinsic and integrated it is of a tapestry. Yeah, that whole scene. It's, it's one of the things that annoys me nowadays when I um, hit, hear people talking about music. Nobody cares about where the inspirations have come from, or even where the samples have come from. Like if you've got someone like, um, uh, let's say, just Dr. Dre, you know, an amazing producer, produced hits for himself and loads of other people but his samples come from the most obscure of places, like yeah. soundtracks for the Thomas Crown Affair and stuff like this. And like, for me, that's the interesting part. Yeah. Like how you take those elements, same with African Bambata sampling, um, uh, God, not computer love, 
Jeez. No, it was um, craft work, wasn't it? Craft work, there you go. Yeah. Got my head. Like, craft work, man. What? Yeah. But to go from that into like the, what it was essentially underground black culture music, I mean, that's mm. that's quite a huge step. But it's because African Bambata had such an interest in music and that's why I was so into it. Like this, this vast array of music that you can take from and use to create something completely new. Mm-hmm. Like nowadays, there just doesn't seem to be a, um, a love for that knowledge, let's say. I, I feel you. I th- it feels like the... Um, Different the... people in the music business, but for easy yeah. listeners, they just don't care anymore. Nah. The subculture that drives, that that is the the um, framework of what what makes people want to go and find a, a, a sample or a break. It's, if there isn't an avid listener, then it kind of derails the motivation of wanting to find a good break doesn't it i mean that's yeah. a, i used to love looking on the back of records and seeing what samples were and like you know just geeking out yeah for sure the um the sample culture i think helped an awful lot of people get into music when there's there was really no um avenues open to them yeah. um as an example i i can remember when i first heard someone like the streets and mm. thinking, where the hell has this come from? Oh my god! Yeah, you know what I mean? Because it was so left of center. Yeah, like it literally sounded like a guy in his bedroom making music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, I can't even say the word streets and not think of that first album and get goosebumps. Yeah, yeah, because it absolutely. was so defining. Yeah, I remember the first time hearing on, on. I mean, it was probably on something like Pete Tong on Radio One. Yeah. I was in a car driving. I was think obviously I was super still into like dance music at the time, and I was just thinking, "What the hell is this?" Can what we swear on this yeah. podcast, by the way? Say again. Can we swear? Oh, mate, it's your podcast. You <laughs> go to hammer a fucking. Yeah. Time. So I, when I heard that in the car, I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Me, me too, bro. I, I remember where I was. It's just all these kind of mad. It's mad, isn't it? Yeah, and and he also, you know, staying on the subject of. You know, Mike Skinner, you know, who I, I I did a few shows with him when he first ever did gigs. We did mm-hmm. Brixton Academy and, you know, I just, I remember the, the heat on him. But I still was like, because he, he was so people big. people off the live shows? Just, it was like the first one. I mean, obviously he's turned yeah, into I, a powerhouse. I house, remember but, at the time, like a lot of the music press talking about whether he could do what that's he was right. on stage. Yeah, he pulled it off. I, I was warming up for him. And then there was also Dizzy Rascal and More Fire crew at the time. And um, man, but here's the thing. I, for the age that I share with him, I still felt like he was older than me. I felt like because his maturity in just breaking through with a different kind of sound and me being so detached and just ex- experiencing like original pirate material in its first yeah, impact. It just felt like I was so removed from it, and and even now, man, just list, you know, he's it's great, a great artist, huh? Yeah, and actually, that that's a really good album to focus on the album cover as well, because I remember seeing that photo of the tower block and just like it just fitted perfectly, you know, perfectly, perfectly. Um, and then you know, just again referring back to your collaboration with Mick and um, a of course, you're mixing up different mediums with some of these iconic moments in Mick Rock's career. But um, couple that with the sample culture in music having gone away, but yet there's something extremely special when two different genres merge in that particular way. Yeah. You guys, are you're kind of capturing that in a new media 2021 kind of way, which isn't happening even in music. Hopefully. I mean, I would never have painted it that way, of course. Um, but for me, it was like a no-brainer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fucking make <laughs> Well, because I got to look through <clears throat> not just the kind of greatest hits of Mick Rock's career, but stuff that he's never even published. Mad. Even if the, the collaboration had never uh, materialised, mm. I still would have wanted to go through that um, that library of work. Did you... Did you- in your head, did you, you know, did your mind get blown when you were just going through these archives? That must have just yeah. like... Absolutely. 
Tell us about Lou Reed, because I know you're a fan and I'm a fan, but did he have any extra bits on Lou Reed that you've just been like, oh my God, I'm seeing you, I'm the only one who can see this? Yeah, loads. <laughs> Absolutely loads. And I mean, like, also, with the stuff like with uh, Lou Reed and Iggy Pop and David Bowie, you yeah. expect, well, if you know anything about Mick Rock, you're expecting them, because that they were his kind of three musketeers, if you like. For sure. Um, but, like, people like Peter Gabriel. like What? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, there's some mad photos with Peter Gabriel, and they are, like, proper mad as well. well the So album era. Um, actually, I don't know. It must have been the, like, 78 or 79, for sure. Okay, so, so maybe. Yeah, okay. But um, I don't think they ever got published because they are, like, out there. Really out there. Really? Like? Yeah. Was, was it Peter Gabriel when he was dressing up in all that regalia yeah, and shit? Exactly. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> he has a he has a pair of tights over his head with um with holes cut in the tights. I mean <laughs> So yeah, I mean this we're we're also talking post-COVID, right? So this is like masking with that voluntary yeah. masking. <laughs> Genius, love it. See, you talk about new romantics, man. I mean, you know, Peter Gabriel was way ahead of the curve there, right? Whoa. The collaboration did come about because of Lou Reed as well, in a roundabout way. Because right. I had um I had painted artworks with the kind of Velvet Underground famous banana um album mm. cover. And I also I had also painted a, an artwork with the Transformer art cover because a lot of the stuff that I do nowadays is more focused on traditional uh, clothing, mm -hmm. uh, specifically Asian and Oriental cultures. Mm -hmm. But I think, well, you can see in the background there, there's, yeah. there's still some kind of like pop, um, more pop imagery or more rock and roll type imagery. Yeah, if you're just and listening so, and you're not watching, then you're yeah. missing some tricks behind the, behind the scenes <laughs> here. <yeah. laughs> so in, in the early days, especially, I was really into um, injecting some of the the sort of famous rock imagery same like uh, joy division um the famous um sine wave cover yeah that, that that kind of stuff is interesting to me not just because of the lack of um rock and roll history that mm. there is nowadays um but also because like i've been into music all my life why wouldn't i want to include some of that stuff like sonic youth anything really that kind of might um Anyone who's viewing those things in a modern day era would look at them and think, "What? What is that? What's that? Yeah. What's that T-shirt all about?" Um, and so, because uh, Mick was um, represented by the same gallery as as I was, it was the gallery owner that sort of suggested the collaboration. And mad, like he was into it. So yeah, like it was a no brainer for me, of course. You know. That that is actually insane when you think about the serendipity of it, but. Just going back to your um, the the methods in which you create, because when you talk about a Joy Division album, when you talk about the the Lou Reed album, you know, particularly with the Banana, um, I mean, of an era, there was treatments and means and ways that these were these these visuals were created. Do you go back as do you go back like that in terms of your output? What's your um, what's the creative day in the life for Finn? Like, do you? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, do you use materials? Yes. Yeah, in yes. that same yeah. respect as they would have done? Constantly sourcing um, images, constantly taking images, constantly documenting images. Wow. Thousands upon thousands of them. Sometimes um, I use the computer create, to create um, the, the kind of sketch, if you like, of the, of the pieces that I do. Mm -hmm. But essentially those sketches are photo collages. I, I take pieces from lots of different photographs and I sort of meld them all together. So like, it, like again, I'll refer to the pieces behind me. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Those images might look like one image, but actually there's potentially four or five or anywhere up to 10 different images all pieced together on the computer to make it look like it's just one figure. Mad. And sometimes that's, that's a completely illogical way of working because you know, you, you, might, you might get a torso of a girl, but you don't like the way her arm is being held. So you, you find another arm from somewhere else. Mm. And it's, it's just a weird way of working. And I don't know why I've gone down that route. Like I very rarely do photo shoots with my models. Um, 
because you've got all the things there at your disposal you can recreate your perfect it's a, it's a couple of things like for for one the the sort of the typical artist news relationship is something i've always wanted to avoid i don't want i never I wanted you. there to be that kind of like dirty old man kind of scenario <laughs> associated with it because obviously my my models are super super young um yeah. and so i never wanted to be in a the the position where I was doing a photo shoot and there was some sort of discomfort either from myself or from the models. Uh, so yeah, yeah, I've yeah. always just left it up to the models to both find the time and the, the energy, if you like, to take the photographs themselves. They don't have to be super high res. They can be taken like a selfie on the phone. It doesn't mm -hmm. matter to me because like I said, it's not a case of getting them to provide me with, with an image that I'm going to paint in its entirety. All I want from them is a, a face shot or a head shot mm. where there's a certain look about it, there's a certain feel or there's a certain attitude to it. And then it's up to me to sort of build the, the, the torso or the scenario around that look on her face. Yeah, attitude. Now you say that. That's what it's you, all about. It's, and, you know, again, you know, street art is defined by the medium you know and you know using spray paint and i think that's where graffiti artists majority of them get the hump because it's well you know what's the difference between that and this you know but um i think you lie in a real uh unmistakable place in the landscape which is that punk side that that attitude side that doesn't rely on a medium and i know what you're saying about the street art as a as a platform to showcase your stuff but it's gone way beyond that and it, now it feels like you're moving into a direction well or you are you are orbiting in in, in a in a place where actually it, it, mediums aside this is just raw energy of a punk oh. nature that may well be the case with with regards to the art and and how it looks and maybe yeah. to do with my attitude and my outlook but actually i mean in, in real life i'm not punk at all no it's attitude i think it's i think it's an energy it's an anarchic uh, like you say, taking elements from the computer, reverse engineering it, putting it onto um you know a medium or materials that are you know more hands on and going for yeah, you yeah i th i think the, the 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 thing with punk is that for for better or worse there's um a, an obnoxiousness associated with it yeah you know what i mean yeah. and that doesn't necessarily have to be the case like sure if you think of um uh, let's just say the writers like uh, hunter s thompson or jack kerouac well mm -hmm. they had a punk attitude as well but yeah. they weren't obnoxious they weren't uh, necessarily in your face what they did might have been in your face but mm. they themselves were not. I mean, for sure, Hunter S. Thompson is a complete, like, unique person. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> um, but I, I just think that there's a, for the most part, there's an obnoxiousness associated with punk attitude that doesn't necessarily have to be there. You Another can good example. That. Another good example while we're on that is, you know, uh, Rick Mayo and Aid Edmondson, yeah, you know. exactly. Can, the younger ones. Yeah. Their yeah. energy. Doing, sorry, as you were, doing, sorry. Doing something different doesn't have to be associated with being obnoxious. No. No. No matter what. Yeah. That's really, that's a really keen point. Now, I'm glad we're getting out across in this conversation. <laughs> for sure. It's a, one of those most forgotten things. I mean, you know, okay, we we don't need everybody being happy and jo jollyful as well. You know, they, they, I think there's a, a measure of, there's a measure of energy based on social commentary and, what's going on in the world but mm -hmm. but to, to have the energy but also still uplift that's a real trick yeah, isn't it for sure damn and this is the thing you see with this collaboration you got with mick it's like actually it's a celebration you still got the rock and roll you still got that that energy but it is a celebration isn't it yeah and it's, the, it's about the attitude as well, because the one thing that you, you have to say about Mick's um, photography and his whole history of what he's done is that they have attitude, yeah. at least in the photos, you know? Yeah. And that's that's 100% what I go for in my work as well. It might, def it might be defined as a slightly different attitude, but it's still an attitude. It's a kind of a fuck the world attitude. Mm. Like, who are you looking at? 
that's that's one of the things that I get constantly with my work. Um, I don't necessarily imbue the models with that, but a lot of people say to me like, "Your your girls are, you know, they're pretty, but you wouldn't want to fuck with them." <laughs> <laughs> You're like, "Yeah, they're my girls. What do you expect, man? <laughs> they're my fucking girls." <laughs> that's that. That's actually probably the most like excellent acclaim you could fucking never have right <laughs> well it is in as well because like the, the the scenario that i was just mentioning about the the artist and his muse well also with the work the the approach to it was always about not sexualizing or objectifying the women mm. and make sure that they kind of um they stood proud in themselves like through the artwork yeah it looked like that they had strength they looked like they shouldn't be messed with they looked badass mm-hmm. and they're like obviously based on people's feedback i've obviously done what i maybe set out to do for sure <laughs> like there's a sub- superhero element to yes, your... it definitely is <laughs> like even the mask of the eyes like in different color yeah. like a scene in the back there that for yeah. sure that's kind of like your it's become recently one of your kind of motifs isn't it yeah, but and that's the other thing is that like that that whole mask motif is, you know, when you take any of the superheroes, let's say Spider Man, Batman, when you take off the mask, they're just normal citizens, mm-hmm. nothing special. That's exactly what I want with the the um, the effect of my work to be. Yes, those girls look badass. Yes, that they look like they might kick the shit out of you or whatever. But actually, behind that mask, mm. they're just normal people. Do you think that could be? Do you think that analogy could be said for artists themselves? Like, well, that analogy is definitely a thing for me because um, when I got into art, I was completely broken. Um, mm. The art, the art, was never meant to be a career. In in actual fact, it was just about using um, a tool or a mechanism to clear my head. Like, art yeah. was a meditation for me because I needed to take my mind off the stuff that was going on around me because I didn't really have any control over it anyway. Yeah. Um, however it was going to happen, it was going to happen without my input and worrying about it was just making me sick. So yeah. I, I definitely used my art in a way to um, lift myself up. Mm. So there is that element of, you know, the art for me was is the mask for Spider-Man. He that is that beautiful. To make himself a better person. Man, that's so, so sick. <laughs> yeah, it's really, yeah, that's poetic. And I think a lot of people, in fact, anyone that's getting into the creative arts and has the energy, power and attack and just vengeance to, to the world <laughs> and doing something extremely different as well. Like, and I don't I even just, think it's about people wanting to get into it as a as a career. For, for me, no. art, art is an expressive way of getting rid of your shit. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You can you can say the same about rappers. Maybe, I mean, especially the early rappers, you know, they were they were rapping about the scenarios that they were placed in in their lives and yeah. talking about it in a way that had never been done before. So they were expressing themselves through their lyrics yeah. and and making themselves heard and making themselves better by documenting what was going on around them. Back then as well, which is actually quite interesting as a as an example, being the age I was at the time, not fully being sold on the hip-hop thing. I was more, you know, up until about the age of like 12, 13, I was definitely into like my punk, metal, rock, glam rock. I was into all that stuff as a kid. And then I had Public Enemy and the whole shit changed. But um <laughs> Public Enemy was like the <laughs> Public Enemy was like the meter of like okay this is cool because everything up till then and to to hip hop's credit was very playful it was a yeah. playful thing you know and go, just going back to what you were saying about you know what motivates artists to do certain things and you don't always have to be like super aggressive and hardcore hip hop was a great example of that yeah the need to do it to get out of a situation, but do it in the right way. Absolutely. I mean, the um, people like Grandmaster Flash with the message, I mean, that that was essentially the the type of hip hop that I was into very mm. early. 
Um, I think Public Enemy and NWA were just going back to that that early stance on hip hop. You know, it wasn't about like your bling and your your bitches, <laughs> whatever <laughs> else. It, it was about talking about social ills and talking about things that were just wrong in, in their world. I mean, yeah. for sure, the first time I heard something like The Message, I didn't understand that it was their reality because it was a, it was a New York reality. And it was yeah. something that um, as a young guy living in, in London, I hadn't experienced that. Of course I hadn't. But it still made me want to hear it and sort of look into it. Art news. Same with Public Enemy. Yeah. I mean, I, I remember going to a Public Enemy concert in, I think it might have been 87 at the Brixton Academy. Oh, shit, you went to that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And walking around mm. the corner, I was with my sister. We walked around the corner and obviously there was tons of people queuing and like, it, it was uh, unsettling because mm. there was hardly any white people there. Mm -hmm. You know, that was a scenario that at the time you just, you never found yourself in. Mm -hmm. Those the, the black communities and the Indian communities and all the other communities, we were all separate. Like for me, the the coming together of all those communities happened with dance music, with house music in the late 80s, because yeah. that was a scene where it didn't matter where you were from or what color you were or how rich you were or how poor you were. It's just you're all there together and ecstasy is making everything fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Throw that in yeah. as well. It was really weird, like to the point where my sister turned around and said, to me, oh my God, I think we're the only white people here. And I was like, no, 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 I, I can see a few people. <laughs> but but like you say, like dance music was really the purveyors of, um, you know, mixed cultural yeah. people in in, in ba on balance in, a, in an area because it was it was actually more about the BPM the drug, the, the 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 unification of the genre. Exactly. That really did it, right? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I think it's, the other thing as well is that in the, the world we live in currently, it's it's probably not easy to understand just how separate our cultures were. Mm. You know, even to the point where, you know, you have somewhere like um, Southall in, in um, West London, which is predominantly Indian and Pakistani. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they are, you know, there's a lot of those um, nationalities there. Mm -hmm. Then you go to the next um, borough along, like Hayes and Harlington or uh, somewhere like Ealing, and they're not there. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think it was the 80s and the 90s, late 80s and 90s, that really kind of changed that, in this country anyway. Yeah, for sure. It, it, it definitely. And I wonder what was the, obviously, like, rave culture, kicked in that was a massive catalyst there's yeah. always a tech there's always a technological edge though isn't there something always triggers a, a, a movement doesn't it sure if it's not media with instagram and facebook before that it was mtv in a video before maybe it was mtv maybe mm. it was definitely the late 80s and early 90s when they started playing a lot of um hip-hop right that's right that's right it's funny isn't it it's funny isn't it how what we talk about in the current perspective is, yeah, well, this is like some new pop culture, street art, da, 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 da. when the truth is, you know, it's, it's all, it's all, uh, it's all, I think rehash would be the wrong, be that bit, bit, bit too harsh. More, I it's so. <laughs> recycling. It's almost like recycling the, the, from its origins you know what i'm saying like mtv would definitely do you remember those commercials they used to do where it would just be super yeah. arty and shit like <laughs> i think the problem nowadays is that nothing is given enough time to be underground anymore that's right 100 percent. and the underground is where the kind of real um well historically i think the underground is where the real creativity happens mm. I think once you get into the kind of commercial aspect and the populist aspect, I think the creative kind of goes away because it's it's overtaken by the the money men, let's say. Yeah, hundred percent. Something out of you, and especially in this day and age where you know you throw an idea out, you know, Madaro, you know, if you didn't you guys didn't forge that and make it actually a thing, it's it would, it would probably be like a. <laughs> A Greek orange juice on one of the islands over there. <laughs> Jimmy, the name alone would be Nick because it, you know social media takes a lot and 
you know, people yeah. get really popular on something that wasn't even their idea. Yeah, what about that dude joined lockdown with the um, the Fleetwood Mac Dreams? Do you remember that? The guy. No, talk to me about that. The, 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 I can't. I can't remember his name, but he basically he's um he's a Latino guy from LA, and he was on his skateboard videoing himself. I mean, he was obviously doing this um, regularly, but he videoed himself skateboarding down an empty like freeway or something like that um, with the Fleetwood Mac Dreams playing in the background and it just went viral i mean that's they, crazy they even talked about it on joe rogan's podcast mad but there's like you know when you <laughs> when you take it apart something like that and the the, the reasons for it go, going viral i mean there's there's nothing in it do, do you know what no. I mean? there's no substance it's yeah. just a guy who f- filmed himself i mean now he's doing loads of stuff he was uh, he was he was drinking a bottle of not Sunny D, but something like that. Some like real American brand of, of like juice. Mm-hmm. And that, that company sponsored him. <laughs> and the, the Fleetwood Mac track went like, the, the sales of it went absolutely crazy because of course there are lots of, um, of the younger generation nowadays who have no clue who Fleetwood Mac is. No, nah, not Dicky. But they heard it on this little Instagram click and, and then they go buy it. It's the new, <laughs> it's the new sampling. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine like Fleetwood Mac, you know what I mean? Just, you know, any individual from the band just waking up one morning and just sitting in an upshot of like, God knows how many sales. Well, what the fuck's going on here? What the hell's going on? I think Mick Fleetwood went to meet the guy. No way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think they had they had like millions of Spotify plays. Millions. Because of crazy. that. Crazy. Yeah, yeah. It is crazy. But I mean, great for the guy. Yeah. You know, he's a, I would say he's, in his 40s, um, living in um, a trailer somewhere in, in California or L.A., mm. um, un, I think unmarried father. I could be completely wrong about that. But, you know, great for him that he's being mm. sponsored by the, the skateboard company and the drinks company and, and whatever else. Goes to show you got to be in it to win it, haven't you? Yeah. And also it, it's like... It doesn't even necessarily have to be planned. It can just be pure chance now, can't it? Which is actually really exciting, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. It, 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 you know, these zeitgeist moments aside, right? I was thinking a little while in on our conversation, I thought, starting so late in your career, would you, argue, would you, would you argue that maybe some of the, paths that you took from being in the house scene being in the club scene soho you know the music you were into all these different things you know and you you get to a certain age however old you are now but you've done all this thing and you say oh i'm late i'm late to the party but you know i'm I'm making up for it now kind of thing but in actual fact do you feel like there's elements of all of your path that became a set skill that allowed you to um ignite what was a definitive project moment being your art? Do you think there's other elements that, that helped facilitate that in your yes. career? Yes, 100%. So in my, while I was DJing on the side, I was also um, a draftsman. I did technical drawing for engineering companies for years and years and years. Like the, the two things I was interested in school were Brilliant. art and technical drawing. And unfortunately for me, my high school or secondary school didn't do art. They did technical drawing. So I did that for my um, A-levels. Um, but th- what I do now, especially when I'm doing it on walls, there's a majorly technical aspect to it. And I have all that technical drawing training. So there's nothing that I get um, apprehensive about, let's say. Like once you get over the size of the wall, <clears throat> um, there is a there's definitely a fear that's associated with going bigger for sure. Mm. Once you get over the size of it, it, it's exactly the same. You just have an extra technical aspect of it that you have to work out. I think that's what a lot of people ask the question. I'm pretty sure they ask you it a lot. I end up asking a lot of graph writers the size of something is like, yo, how do you even begin to scale that shit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not. Like, I mean. Everyone has their methods. I, I learned my method from an Australian guy, um, a guy whose work I had um, 
been a fan of for many, many years, a guy called Roan. Um, mm. I met him in Miami, joined the, the Basel Festival, which is like one of these things that all the street artists go to every year. I love it, yeah. And he was doing this thing where he was like, he was making marks on the wall. And I was watching him. He was a friend of mine at that point as well. And he he came over and he's like, you, you should do this. You should try this. And I was like, well, what is it that you're doing? And so he explained to me that he was just putting marks on the wall, taking a photograph, overlaying his image on those marks, making it semi-transparent so he could see the marks on the wall through the image that he was going to paint. Yeah, I gotcha. And so he would use those marks as reference points to either scale up or get the proportions of the portrait right. So rather than using like a projector or something, Correct. you know, crass like yeah, that. Yeah, because be... that's, that's one of the things that's frowned upon. Yeah, 100%. Because, I mean, you know, there, there's, there's definitely uh, times to do that. Like if you're stuck um, for time on a job, I would definitely use a projector. I have no qualms about that whatsoever. But also, I try as much as I can not to use a projector. Because there is a kind of a... There's a kind of a cheating analogy associated with that. And I've definitely seen artists who don't just use the projector to sketch out, but actually use the projector to paint. So they, they've got the image on the wall and they're just, you know, they're painting over what they're seeing, which for me is a, a definite cheat. Yeah, it's um, like a beatbox you use in a metronome. You don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> or a tape. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> recorded. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Yeah, then I mean, <clears throat> the projector thing is one of the the things that I've I've done as much as I can to avoid being associated with that. Um yeah. and yeah, for sure, when I'm doing these marks on the wall, I think with my work as well, because I'm not just painting a picture, the muses that I choose are super important. So when I paint them, I, I want the piece to look like them. And so that means mm. that the the scaling up has to be done to a, a fine degree. So yeah. the marks that I put on the wall can look absolutely crazy. And numerous times I've been asked by passers-by, like, what the fuck are you painting? <laughs> 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 because it does look mad for like the first couple of days. Um, Come back in a weekend, love. Come back. Up. Yeah, that's. I've, I've actually said that to some people. I had a funny one in LA. I was, I was doing a, a three different portraits on a massive building and... Like it was downtown LA instead of Koreatown, actually. And um, loads of people were coming by. It was in an area where there was like um, some government buildings and some like upper class kind of stuff. Gotcha. And uh, so it was quite a shock for them to see this thing going up. But some guy came by like a few days. He didn't say anything. He was just like in his convertible car out for a drive. And then like about a week in, he came by and he's like, oh, hey, what happened to the squiggles? And I was like, oh, they were just like marks to help me to um, paint the portraits. He just said, oh, I think I preferred the squiggles. <laughs> yeah, Charming. Classic. Like, st I think uh, at that point I was like eight days in. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You think, like, okay, cool. Let me just reverse this. Uh, <laughs> you know, if we don't know you like it. Yeah. Jesus Christ, man. <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a liberty take, to be quite honest. <laughs> but the, the squiggles and the marks, for me, they kind of look a bit like the sort of Keith Haring thing. Yeah, 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 for that, sure. That's essentially what they look like, to, especially to an untrained eye. So that's probably what he was getting a vibe of. Yeah, yeah. He thought he was going one way. Yeah. That's funny. Keith Haring, see? Do you, do, are you inspired by Keith Haring? I'm inspired by all of those guys from New York in the early... Basquiat? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I can't... I've, I've said this to numerous um, people over the years, like my, my, the inspirations for my work, you can't see in my work. I feel that. I, I don't think that my work is um, a jumping off from anybody else's work. Um, mm. But for sure, there are lots of people who've uh, inspired me, maybe just with their attitude or um, with the way that they approach things, how they market themselves, how they brand themselves. All of those things are stuff that as an artist you don't necessarily have to have them but they'll help yeah for sure and i'm sure there's um there's some areas you would have liked to have walked down you know in terms of inspiration where you know you're face to face with the live performers that mick was taking shots of and you know everyone has those ideals in fact everyone i often think to myself oh man i wish i was around in the you know early 80s you know what i mean you know we all have those ones but is there anything from 
Is there anything from uh, maybe a hindsight point of view where you'd wished there were certain things that you'd developed in your techniques earlier in, in your life? No. Nothing that kind of, you no, know, like, do you reckon I, you could have been a graph writer? No, I couldn't. Cause I, I don't have the, um, not just the tool set. I, I don't have the attitude. Mm. I never have had the attitude. Um, mm -mm. Yeah, for sure. As a street artist in my early days, we went out and did illegal work, but um, there was a, a threshold to that, um, if you like, criminality. It wasn't something that I was ever going to be arrested for or put in jail for. And I think as a graph writer, you are kind of constantly treading that fine line. Yeah. Um, I've, I've avoided that. The, the reason I don't, I don't think I should have approached anything any differently is because I, I think that's what, what's happened to me happened as and when I was ready for it. I feel that. And that's not just because of the, like the, the amount of coincidences that happened in order to get me from the life that I was living into being a full-time artist and a successful one, it's ridiculous. Like mm. even when I was living it in my early, in my early artist days, there was things happening or things presenting themselves to me. And I was just thinking to myself, this, this can't be a coincidence. This is like the universe working for me and putting things in front of me and yeah. it's up to me to see them and to um, act on them. Because yeah. for sure in the, the past 10 years of my life, when I was um, settled down with a partner, I can honestly say that I saw nothing come my way. The way I look at it now is the universe doesn't work like that. The universe for me is constantly putting things in front of you and you either, you're either ready to see it or whether ready, um, ready to accept it or you just carry on doing what you're doing. For me, I was, um, I was in a very negative space. I was definitely in a space that wasn't um, conducive to me being either creative free spirited or, or anything or even happy mm. but once that situation was removed from my life i'm not going to go into how it was removed mm. but essentially the it, it seemed to me like the universe knew that okay all that negativity is gone now time for us to start putting some positive things in his way and see where he goes with that yeah you know i said earlier on about the fact that like for me I, i've been on a journey but it's not like i've been steering the ship it's yeah. always felt that way to me. It's always felt like these are just things that have been waiting for me to act on mm. or waiting for me in the wings, ready mm. for me to sort of like take the stage, if you like. Yeah. Um, and they just all, it all happened in a certain period of time. And so it couldn't have happened any earlier. Your receptors were on. Yeah. And maybe there was an element of fight or flight in that as well. Once you had, you know, been, the stabilizers were off you, uh, yeah. Being in your relationship, it was like, okay, right, I've got something to prove. Not, not to anyone else but myself. Exactly. And that, that's definitely how I approached it because for me, um, whatever I had or hadn't achieved in my life up to that point, I did feel like a sad excuse for a man. I, mm. I felt like a shell. I felt mm -hmm. like I hadn't really hit any kind of potential. I mean, even when I was a DJ, I, I always felt like a fraud because I was just playing other people's music. I wasn't being creative um, enough, let's say. Like right. for me, I definitely would have wanted to make music. I did produce certain pieces of music, but again, they weren't, um, they weren't exactly what I wanted. And because I wasn't, um, I didn't play any instruments and I wasn't musically inclined um, per se, there was always a kind of, um, if you like a letdown experience, it was never quite as good as I would have hoped it to be. Whereas as an artist, I'm in complete control of whatever it is I produce. So if it doesn't come out right, there's only one person to blame. And for me, taking the blame is exactly oh, yeah. the same as taking the responsibility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh, God, that resonates so hard with me. I feel that. I, I like, con I'm not a control freak, but it does become hard to delegate on creative yeah. decisions. You've just got to be responsible for them, good or bad. Yeah, exactly. And that's another thing that I did when I started painting was that I, you know, for sure that the, the 10 years prior to that were an absolute mess for me. Um, mm. But I didn't blame my partner. I took responsibility for that myself because I knew that that's what I had to do. Okay, the, the scenario I was in might not have been helped by my partner, but 
it was my responsibility to live my life the way I wanted to and not use her as an excuse for not um, achieving or not being what I wanted to be. Right, yes. Yeah, I get you. I get you. That's, that's, and you know what? That takes a mature head as well, bro. <laughs> like all these things, they could all play out very differently. But if you've got a, you know, if you've got a sound mind and you, you've thought things through in a real practical way and you own the situation you put yourself in, right? Yeah, I mean, I can't say that at that point in time I did have a sound mind, but I knew that all the stuff that had led me to that point, they they had happened for a reason. Mm. Maybe the reason was that I needed to be broken before I could fix myself. And so the the um, the journey through my art has actually culminated in, I guess you might call it a spiritual journey as well. Like it, it mm. definitely enabled me to be far more content, far more um, patient with life and the way things work. And also far more um, kind of stoic about things, you know? Mm. Yeah, because bad things are going to happen no matter what. They always do. It's not the the event or the scenario that you find yourself in doesn't have to dictate how you feel about it. You dictate uh, how you feel right. about it. You dictate how you react to it. And yeah. that that work is um, stuff that a lot of people ignore for the whole of their lives. Humanity one hundred and one. If you're yeah. going to appeal, if you even if you yeah, even if you're not creative, but if you're if you're going to put something out to Joe public that is incredibly personal stoicism. <laughs> you have to. Mm. Yeah. Damn. That's interesting. Yeah. So coming out of your relationship or your marriage, uh, okay, let's break it down. Right. So what the fuck? <laughs> How'd you start off, right? You said, right, I'm going to just do this. Explain to people how you did and have achieved what you achieved from that point on onwards, because everyone's been through that kind of car crash moment in their lives and they've got two roads to go down. What? How did you embrace that? Um, so the first thing to clarify is that I didn't take myself out of that situation. I was That situation was forced upon me. It wasn't me that made the decision to um, end the relationship. There was a lot of stuff um, associated with that decision. Okay. It didn't seem reasonable for me. And certainly it shouldn't have happened the way that it did happen. Yeah. Um, there were far better ways to have done that than what became the reality. Okay. Um, and for me, I, I've always been a kind of a reasonable person and always tried to, you know, find a solution, whether that solution was going to be us breaking up or doing it amicably, be that that would be the way that I would always go. But mm. that didn't happen. And on top of that, there was um, there was children involved, mm. and the culmination of all that, all those um, that anger and frustration, if you like, from my partner was that she stopped me seeing my children, and Shit. that culminated in um, legal cases. It also culminated in me being hospitalised because of stress, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And eventually, I mean, the court cases they were. They were stressful dealing with her. Lawyers were stressful because she didn't want to be reasonable about, about anything. Um, oh, but essentially the, the the courts found in my favor in terms of getting access to my kids. But I, I was dealing with someone who didn't want to, um, uh, she didn't want that to happen. And so she behaved after the um, court case even worse than she had done before. And for me, that whole scenario was killing me. And I did, yeah, of course. Feel, I did feel that um, because of the stress. And I remembered speaking to my mum about it at the time because obviously, you know, she had a grandchild involved. And mm. I actually said to my mum, I'm going to have to walk away from this because I think if I if I put up with it any longer, I'm going to be dead within two years. That, yeah. was, that was a definite feeling that I had about myself and my, my body. And so it was the actual walking away that changed everything. Because, and it's a, it's a horrible way to, to think of it, but, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that I was still in a scenario where I couldn't win. I couldn't mm -hmm. do anything about it, and I couldn't, I couldn't make it better because I was dealing with someone who didn't want it to be better. She yeah. wanted it to be the way she wanted it. Yeah. And so, essentially, by me making the decision to walk away, I was taking the power back. I didn't want to do it, but I did it anyway. And I knew it was going to hurt, and I knew it wasn't going to be 
great either in that present moment or in the future. Yeah. Um, but I essentially took my power and, you know, the, the reason I had spoken to my, my parents about it was because I, I wanted their opinion on it. My mom said, yeah, you're doing the, exactly the right thing. She said, it's going to be hard to know that we're not going to see our granddaughter, mm. but you're doing the right thing. You know, it's that, like you were saying earlier on about that kind of like um, will to survive. Mm. Will to survive was more important than the will to, to, to push myself through that pain and hurt in order to facilitate a relationship with my daughter that wasn't wanted by my ex-partner. And, you know, I, I did what I could at the time, but I obviously wasn't strong enough or um, man enough to, to do everything. Um, and so I kind of took the decision that, okay, I'm not happy in my life. Maybe if and when I make myself happy, mm. that scenario can be slightly different. The, the antagonism might not be there anymore, both from me and from my ex-partner. Yeah, because um, clearly it was it was raw and, you know, it, yeah. it took some distance, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, the thing is that that situation has still not sorted itself out. I, I literally have not seen my child for 12, 13 years. That's fucking mad. Wow. But that's what I needed to do. I needed to channel all that energy into the art. Wow. Well, I mean... It is fucked up, for sure. Yeah. But I didn't want to be... I didn't want to any longer be in a situation where the negativity of someone else was dragging me down. For sure. I knew I knew that I had so much more to... Not offer the world, but like I had so much more to me that I needed to, to do and to be a better man and to be a better person and to give something back and, you know, prove something to myself, whatever you want to phrase it. Yeah. But I also knew that with um, with that partner around me, that was never, ever going to happen. Yeah. Because everything about that situation was um, negative for me mm. personally. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was for her as well, because otherwise the, the breakup wouldn't have happened. Yeah. But instead of um, talking about those things and talking about that situation and approaching it from a, an adult um, perspective, mm. she chose to... Um, if you like, <laughs> approach it like a child might by throwing her toys yeah. out of the pram. Yeah, yeah, I feel that. Unfortunate, but I mean, it's it happens to so many people. How old was your child? How old was your daughter when when she was t- uh, three? I was going to say two and a half, but I think she actually had turned three. So she's probably like 14, 15 now. Yeah, yeah, and no memory of me. Say again. No memory of me, obviously. That's just some fucked up shit. Yeah, but like, you know, you can you can focus on all that negative stuff. Yeah, yeah you're right. It doesn't help. No, it doesn't. And the truth comes out eventually. And whatever um, has been spoken of in between that time, the truth the truth will always set them free. Mm. I hope so. Yeah. That's crazy. Um, and while we're, while we're here, I mean, let's, let's remember, vengeance is sweet, saith the Lord. You're there rock, <laughs> rock starring it. <laughs> yeah, and, but I mean, that, that's never been the approach. I mean, it wasn't about proving anything to anybody else. It was about proving it to me. Um, and what you've done is incredible because that most definitely is reflecting on your work and output. You wouldn't have been able to, I mean, there are many exceptions to the rules but you sound to me like personality wise is you're, you're all or nothing and it this this was kind of like the the best of a situation that you were able to like channel exactly 100 percent. you wouldn't have this this wouldn't have happened no it would not <gasps> I, I you know the when i look back at that time i definitely needed to kick up the ass that the universe gave me if you like yeah Sometimes yeah. it does take you to be broken in order to um, get fixed. Be able to piece like there's um there's this um, Japanese um, porcelain technique called kintsugi where they yeah 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 they take it and they put the little gold threads and they piece it all back together. I've heard it. Yeah, yeah. And they do that because in their in their mind, the broken pieces don't make up a broken whole. 
the beauty of the the broken pieces put back together can be as beautiful as the original porcelain was before it was broken. Oh, that's cold. That's a yeah. great analogy for me. It's amazing, yeah. Because I there's no way that I can say that like I'm still not a broken person because you know it's like um like being an alcoholic. You know, you can yeah. go to AA and you can be alcohol free for 20, 30 years, but you still have that inside you. That's still there. It's still, still in your mind, yeah. It still affects you in certain ways. So I'm definitely not unbroken, but let's just say I've been pieced back together pretty well. Yeah. That's that, my friends, is how you uh, orbit as an artist. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, literally, you do reinvent in all of its extremities you reinvent and you constantly evolve and create and let, let life be the the car and you drive it like you stole it <laughs> yeah and the other thing is is that i haven't allowed the the success or the fame or whatever you want to call it i haven't allowed the the effect on my ego to dampen the enthusiasm for doing the work which can for some people that's easily done as well, isn't it? It's so easily done, especially nowadays, because yeah. you're you're being constantly contacted on social media, t- people telling you how awesome you are, blah 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 blah. And it's it's it can be, it could be easy to get carried away with that. But I think for because sure. I have a slightly older head on my shoulders, it's not important to me anymore. That's right. That's right. If only they had given us that head when we first, you know, in our early twenties, <laughs> mate. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. I always wondered why I felt so duped. <laughs> you, you learn so much as you get older, don't you? It's just you know. youth is wasted on the, uh, the young. on the young, isn't it? Yeah. Who said that? Was it Oscar Wilde? Yeah. Yeah. I think so, yeah. I think so. Yeah. One of those other artists that <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> So it's March the third. That's when the, that's when uh, the Medora project is coming out, right? Uh, March the second, as far as I know. Oh, March the second. Okay, well we'll, well, we'll be online and live by then, my friend. We'll be on it. Cool. Anything else you want to add, sir, to conclude your podcast experience on the Killer Keller oh, Show? Thanks for having me. It's been great. It's been like a therapy <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. See, this is what we're here to do. You see, you know, bring nothing but the truth, the truth and gold, the truth and nothing but the truth. Um, you're a star, man. Honestly, Finn, thanks so much for joining me. I've had a really great time talking to you, pal. You <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to stay in touch. Give us a follow on Insta, and then as soon as I've got this stuff ready to go, we'll, uh, I'll throw it your way, and you can have an inspection. Cheers, buddy. <laughs> Finn, back inside the place. Okay. Thank you so much, my brother. Ciao. Killer Keller podcast. That was in life. In like, in was out of fashion. We're gone. See ya. Take care of yourself. Sharing is caring. Stay lucky, people. Peace. 